deep breaths. We got this. We got this. Hey. How you doing? How's your day? You doing okay? Hanging in there? You making it through? I hope so. I'm not going to run an intro on this one. No plugs. Because this is going to be one of my more difficult episodes to do. And I'm excited for it. I haven't been this excited about doing the podcast in a long time. It's also the podcast I've been the most nervous about doing. Maybe ever. Because I'm going to be sharing some interesting things with you in this episode. I'm going to be digging really deep and giving you a piece of my soul. But to be honest, this one's for me. This episode's for me. This is one of the beautiful things about doing this show and doing it consistently is that a lot of you have reached out and have, I think by sharing these things, it helps folks feel seen in this very human element that I know I feel the same way when I share, or excuse me, when I see people sharing these things, I'm like, man, I've gone through that weight. That's what that, like, I think that's a beautiful part. And one of the reasons why most of the media that I consume is interviews and things of that nature is because I like the, the, the ugly parts, the beautiful parts, the experience of what it means to be human. And that's really helpful for me to see other people share those things. And so I do hope that by sharing this podcast with you today, there can be some of that connection. But this one is, to be completely frank, self-serving, and that these are things that I've, there's been a lot of my head, in my head, a lot of my heart, that I've been wanting to share just to get it out of me. And to put it someplace where I can... I can have you all know these things and also hold me accountable, I think, which is really powerful. And so this is not an episode where I'm looking for, I'm not looking for help, quote unquote, but I am hoping that this, by sharing these things with you today in this moment, that this this will this will help me move on and accept these things as well uh, that we're going to be diving into today. So that is the preface for this pod, which it's going to be heavy and it's going to be a little dark. And so if you're not exactly in the place for that, then this might not be the one for you. This is also going to be a pod where I what I share may change your perception of me. And I'm cool with that. It's taken a while for me to get to that point because these things I'm going to, like after this, it's like, I'll never be able to run for public office, like, (laughs) which I probably, I couldn't anyways, like from half of this stuff I've shared on the pod, but I'm always, I've been kind of like gearing up for this episode. Be, I'm always kind of like trying to like figure out where the boundaries are of this podcast of like where I can how far I can push the limits of this thing before it completely blows up in my face. <clears throat> but I think that there's a, I continue to push the boundaries. And the more that I do so, I feel like the better I feel about doing the podcast because I feel like it allows me to open up even more of myself to you and also to myself to see where my own boundaries are and what I feel comfortable sharing and what I don't. And and there's a, there's often, as I'm running these episodes, there's like this voice in the back of my head that's like, oh, don't go into that. Ter-, because there's almost this perception of me that I want you to have versus the actual man that I am. And doing this podcast has really helped me kind of strip that away and to see that the more of myself that I actually show you, the more, the more these actually resonate. It's not about crafting this perception of Kia, but I do feel like there's been a part of me that I've been working through and 
there's another piece of this that I haven't been totally upfront with you with most people about and I want to tackle that today because I want to serve I want this to serve as kind of a new beginning of sorts I feel like I'm at a new beginning I just turned 31 if you haven't followed been following the pod there's kind of some life things that have been going on and this there's a lot of over the last year that's been weighing kind of on me that I've been wanting to share. And I feel like it's taken me a while to also get here to make sure I had a little enough distance from it that I could share it. And I've been listening to a lot of Brene Brown. And if you don't know who Brene Brown is, she's this rock star professor and researcher around emotions and things of that nature. And she's she has a really great TED Talk around shame. And when she talks about shame, she talks about shame thrives in secrecy and in silence. And these are some things that I I do have, I realize I have some some shame about and it's kind of been eating at me. And so I want to, I want to put it out there. Another thing about this too, is if you're, if we're, if we're close, you and I, like close, close, and we talk often, you already know this. So I'm not, I'm not, this isn't going to be something out of left field. If we don't talk often, and maybe you just catch up with me on the pod, this might be a little new. Or maybe not. If you follow the pod, then this is something that you probably could already have figured out on your own. But I'm going to, I want to like 8 Mile this shit. Where it's, if you haven't seen 8 Mile, it's like this Eminem, it's a movie about Eminem's journey with the late and great Brittany Murphy, who I actually think, that killed that performance but he has these like these like sequential rap battles where he continues to get like more difficult opponents and at the very end the whole point of the rap battle is that you're kind of like you're 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 twisting the the knife into people like their most like vulnerable thing even how either how they dress or things they've done or how how they look or their background whatever it is and at the very end spoiler alert Eminem goes up against like the the best other rapper and he he his entire verse is about himself and he's able to like but not in a good way it's like all these things he's like I am a bum he's like I do live in a trailer with my mom and so he's like he pretty much just like he rips himself apart and then he's like here tell these people something they don't know about me and like tosses the mic to the guy and the guy's just like, it's like such a crazy verse. And it's just like so open and vulnerable that the guy just like doesn't have any. It's like you can't have leverage over somebody if they already have put it out there themselves. And so that's my approach with this is like I don't want this to be something that I feel like I have to hide from or run from. I want to be something that this that I can talk about, that I can share myself fully with you, that... I can I can work on accepting of myself and this is like my eight mile rap battle piece it's like you can't have leverage over me if I don't have any secrets to tell right and so this is the a new journey of me just like spilling my guts to y'all telling you exactly what's up and just kind of just eight mile in this shit and so I've thought a lot about about like about this podcast, this episode, and how to even tackle this sort of thing in a way that doesn't, that this one may be oversharing. Like a lot of the times I'm always like, is this too much? Because I want it to still be something that I can can put in a public domain because I do share this. It's a public podcast. And not lose friends and not maybe like lose... uh, you know, have people cha- have their perspective changed of who I am. But I realize if I'm comfortable with who I am, if I'm coming to grips with who I am, then I need to be able to let that go and say, whoever you are, you can judge me, you can think however you want to think about me. <clears throat> and that I have my thoughts about myself, I'm on my own journey, and whatever you are going to think about me, you're going to think. And that that's okay. Because what I've done is done, 
and there's a plenty of life, hopefully, yet to be lived of things that I have yet to do. And thinking about the man that I want to become, and this, I think, is a great medium for me to kind of start to move in that direction. I've already been moving in that direction, but it's become much more clear to me lately being able to really dial into that and listen to that. And I think one of the things that makes this difficult for me is that I am a believer in this fluid identity, that we have these labels we put on ourselves that almost box us in because it makes it easier to understand. It also makes it easier for other people to understand us. So maybe it's like, I was talking to a buddy about this the other night. It's like, I'm a veteran or I'm a Gemini or I'm a, we have these, these labels and identities. And I think that can be powerful if you want to believe something about yourself. I also think it can be difficult because the more that we kind of put these on ourselves, the more then it, it starts to, I think, limit our directions of what we, we think of ourselves, of who we can be, what we can be, what we're good at. Oh, I'm not good at this. Oh, I've, I'm, I'm a this type of person. This is what I'm good at. And those are important things to know, your abilities, your skills, your weaknesses, your strengths. But also, I think to understand, I think this this idea that as humans, we are so adaptable. And that is kind of our superpower. It's like our brain. It's like this big hunk of mush that lives in this like black box in your head that interprets the world as good or bad, etc. I'm not stalling, I promise. This all has a, a purpose to it. So when I was thinking about doing this episode, I was like, how can I share these things about myself in a way that makes sense? And that also are self-serving. Help me start moving past them. And so where I think I want to start with this is around this piece of identity. Because this really resonated with me probably the most when I was in Asia. I've told the story before, but long story short, I never rode motorcycles, scooters, etc. I was like, oh, that's not for me. But when you live in Asia, you have to, you don't have to, but if you want to get around in a lot of these places in Bali and Vietnam and China, like it's helpful to have a scooter or like a motorcycle. And so it's just part of the culture. And so I was like, Kia, if you want to do this, like you're going to need to learn how to ride a motorcycle or a scooter. And so I remember I was in Bali, I was in Changu, and in order to like get around, you needed a scooter. And so I was like, Kia, like, I'm going to need to reframe my perception of myself to be like, I ride motorcycles. And I remember I was in my room and I was lying in my bed and I was like, I was like, I was feeling kind of wish-washy about it. And I was like, I'm just going to switch my perspective and be like, now I ride motorcycles. And then I went out and just like rented a scooter and just like taught myself how to ride. And then a couple months later, I had that whole adventure with my friend Jess and we rode all the, not all the way, but halfway, I guess, across Vietnam throughout the course of a week on some little like motorbikes. And it was really powerful for me to realize how much of our perception of self and our abilities is really very fluid. It's much more, and, and I think very context dependent in terms of good and bad, etc. And that it's like in one Situation, I might be a great guy if I'm doing something really good at, at my, my nonprofit job and then in my personal relationship, I don't know if I'm a terrible boyfriend or something. Like, am I a good guy? Am I, like, there are these things, these kind of concepts that are more gray than they ever are black and white. And that depending on who you ask, the context, what's going on, like, you can be any and all of them. Like, Tony Soprano, like, that's what made that, that show so powerful. Is this this great? It's like this evil mob boss, but family man at the same time. And so we're complicated. And the these things that I want to talk to you about today have helped me understand that more about myself. And that I think that that is a piece of what makes this difficult is that I, <clears throat> I have this perception of self, and I have for a long time, of like wanting to do the right thing, wanting to be a good guy. And then 
maybe I'll act differently out of those things and realize that that's not a true, like that we're all capable of everything pretty much for the most part. And even acting in ways that are outside of our perceptions of what we think, like Breaking Bad even. I'm just giving you characters that like, I think really this resonates with. So this started over around a little over a year ago, but it, it started when I was in Mexico City. And so that was a whole story. There was a whole pot on that. It was actually over a year ago, probably I think last April. And there was a girl I got rejected by. Well, I didn't technically get rejected by her, but she already we were like dating and she had a boyfriend. And it made me feel, I just got really kind of out of sorts with it. And recently, I got rejected again by a girl. And what's nice is now having like a year's worth of like um, practice and meditating and things of that nature, I feel much more comfortable kind of being able to see those emotions and sit with those feelings. But there's definitely something around, I get rejected a lot, but there are certain rejections. I think maybe when you're really high on a person or something happens that just like resonate with you and, and kind of twist the knife a certain way. But I was like, okay, I was like, if I want to, now that I'm back in Medellin, I was like, I want to, I want to date again and, and, and really be intentional about it. And I'm like, okay, if I want to be intentional about it, I have to put myself out there. So I got on the dating apps again. I try not to get on the dating apps too much here for some, they work way better in the States. I don't know what it is, but for some reason out here, like they never make me feel better about myself. I'm always like, you're always kind of, you see like what's out there and, but if they don't like you back or if there's something like you, you, I I find it never makes me feel, I never leave being like, I'm really glad I spent an hour doing that. You know, it's almost like this other kind of I feel almost like another social media platform. Like I just don't love to be on social media even like that. Like I feel like it's kind of like this time suck for me. But there's this 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 validation almost this op- like this this potential opportunity in validation of like is somebody liking me or did they respond is et cetera et cetera. And there's like these different apps and you scroll through and check the messages for each one and it's like it's really it's it's tough. I find myself. I'm not like the best version of myself doing that. And so I had this thought the other day where, again, it's kind of this like, this creep of like dark energy that creeps into my life towards like this lust for women. And I feel like dating, at least here too, especially, it's like hard to describe, but the culture is so sensual and there's a lot of beautiful people that it's like you're just there's like this sexuality that's almost like ingrained as part of like the culture here at least in the city in Medellin I don't know about other places in Colombia I don't feel it in other cities but there's it's a real it's a it's very tangible like you feel it and I feel it here like this animal kind of more instinct here and it is kind of like the wild west and so one of the difficult things about online dating here as well in Medellin is because prostitution's legal there a lot of times you'll uh, you'll be on these online dating apps and the girl either she'll tell you up front and like you'll match will be chatting be like oh wow this really beautiful girl likes me that's cool and it'll be chatting and blah 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 and then she'll be like hey these I'm actually an escort, these are my prices, et cetera. And you're like, oh, okay. Or sometimes you don't even realize it because you'll you'll be out, you'll be having a great time or something like that. And then you might come back to your place and then she's like, oh, actually, this is how much I this is how much I cost. And you're like, wait, what? And so there's this, it's just a it's really hard to explain it unless you've been here and you know it and you can feel it. But there's this 
there's this whole cult, like this, this sexual piece that, and also with the prostitution piece that takes place, a lot of it takes place on these dating apps. And so I was on these dating apps again and got propositioned by a couple ladies and was like really close to doing it. And I realized one thing that I think is really powerful for me is like putting yourself in an environment where you're going to be successful. And Medellin, unfortunately for me in that regard, is like not a great place for me because it's like this temptation for this like darker energy for me, this like lust for validation for women. And for some reason, last year when I came here, Maybe I I didn't have the sense of self that was strong enough. I don't know what it was, but I lost myself to it. And I've talked about this before on the pod, but like started to almost change myself in a way of like started buying new clothes. I never buy new clothes. I started like wearing cologne. I never wear cologne. I was taking girls out on dates that I probably shouldn't have been, but there's this, there's, you almost lose track of what you want in doing it and in that chapter especially last year when i was here i i kind of got swept up in it and because the barrier of entry is not is different like in the states when it comes to prostitution and sex work it's like it's illegal it's probably like i don't know anything about it it there it's like it's i assume it's like kind of seedy like you're in some like back alley and there's like a lady like like smoking a cigarette or something like that and i don't know it's like behind like a motel like it just feels like weird and kind of seedy and but here because it's like kind of in your face and it's like there's there that barrier entry is lower that it was it was something that i was like I think it caught me in a vulnerable moment and I ended up like losing myself to it. And I've started to realize that I think I make a lot of parallels between music and women, at least kind of my, like that kind of like lust for pleasure that or chasing pleasure, like success, et cetera, that it it comes down to addiction and one is is almost culturally uh, like heralded like a success addiction and i realize i think that's why a lot of high achievers also have problems with alcohol and or pills etc is because you have the kind of this like hyper focus and obsessive compulsion for things and so that is something that I have started to see in myself and accept is that I I think it's in my blood as well. I don't think for my mom and dad, but maybe some extended family that I've I've seen is it's it's like destroyed different people's lives in my family. That I and I hate to put that label, use that label because it's again, like I said before, like an identifier. But for myself to realize that, like, I have this dark energy inside of me, and I think, I think I'm an addict, and working on, like, how I can still live this life with these things and reconcile these things. And so last year, it ended up. I think it manifested in sex in that it was, it became very compulsive and obsessive. And I don't know a ton about sex addiction. I know just from what I've Googled around a little bit, I was like, am I like losing my mind here? Like there's something about it that it, it started to go off the rails for me. And however you want to make your money, you can make your money. I'm not having now kind of lost myself to that a little bit. It's, it really helped me, I think, develop a, um, 
being a, like a, a real empathy for people, like being less judgmental. That I never thought I would be a guy that would engage in that behavior of of buying sex. And it was really mind blowing how fast you're able to kind of slip off the slope and just like, again, this perception of who I am or what I am and what I do and how quickly that can change and be something completely different. And now I want to preface this also with like this here, at least in my experience, it's not, it's not again, like the lady in the CD back alley. It's just like, um, there was one girl that I ended up seeing often and she was like a pre-med student and it actually was probably more, maybe a little bit, I don't know, more interesting than even like a Tinder hookup that you normally have where like I'd go see her and, and we'd like chat and make out and then like maybe I'd like give her a massage and we kind of do the business or whatever. But it was either way, I'm not, I'm not, um, justifying it but it helped me realize that like that wasn't an activity that i felt like made me my best self and if this is something that you do if whether you're a, a whether you're the lady or you're a guy and you do these things i'm i'm not saying this is like inherently something that you should or shouldn't do i do think that there it's incredibly complicated and complex, especially as a white man, as a foreigner down here, that there's all these dynamics that go into it around power and money and status that not even with prostitution down here alone. I mean, that's something that I think as well, like, I just didn't feel like I was like, am I, con am I contributing? Like making, I, this is like really hypothetical for like, or like really top level for like maybe just something around sex. But like, I'm like, am I contributing to something that I feel like good about? And I was like, not always the case, but I think especially when it comes to like this idea around um, sex, for me, it's something that it's it's a little bit more difficult to navigate compared to like booze or pills or coke or anything like that because those are substances that. Well, twofold. One, it's just you. Like, if you're doing coke or something, most unless like you you're or, like an alcohol and like it ends up like in like affecting your family. Which if you're an addict, I think it inevitably does. But like for the most part, there's like kind of like in, inherently like kind of self destructive activities that you can do and kind of like it's it's it might be really difficult, but it's like self destructive. And I think for me, one of the hard parts about this was that it's not just me. Like this is like an, a behavior that inherently involves somebody else. And so that was, that was something too that I, I found didn't, I just didn't, it didn't resonate with like who I thought I was. But then the fact that I was able to do those things so easily also really, kind of destroyed my sense of identity in a way because you have these things of like who you think you are and then when you go against those it's it can be really kind of jarring and so that was partially why the impetus for even wanting to do the ayahuasca last year was to like dig deeper into like my psyche and be like what are these what is it oh, like what is it about these behaviors that is like so alluring in a way and one i think is biological of like sex is something that you got to do you don't have to do but like that's what i was saying before about like the self destructive piece is like if you're doing booze or pills or something like that like those aren't something that you inherently like have to do or like or even like i mean drinking i guess is socially acceptable but with sex and food addictions, I don't think I have a food addiction, but I think those are things that are hard because they're almost like kind of intrinsically part of the human experience. So it's like, where do you kind of, where is a healthy amount? How does it, when does it become unhealthy? And um, 
that for me, that was a big impetus for wanting to do the ayahuasca was like, how can I figure out like, what's the root of this thing? And I realized that that same compulsion and energy, I think for me, comes in wanting to like work a lot and be successful. And these are things that I've been working through. I'm currently like um, working in therapy on these sorts of things to try to like dial into like what these things are. But I, I feel like they kind of stem from the same place. And I know I'm not alone in that. I think in maybe in like the, the sexual piece, like that is something that is, I, I assume that's not something that most of you have engaged in, in that sort of the behavior, but like this sort of like the, these sorts of like, whether it's pleasure, power, money, fame, like what it is about these things that is, they're almost like these unspoken contracts that we sign, at least as Americans, that we sign kind of growing up. That's like, these are things that you feel inherently like you need to pursue. And what was crazy about the, this period for me, especially with sex, was that it was like any, like any of those four things, whatever your vice is, the more you chase it, it's like the farther it slips away from you. Like as soon as I got it, it'd be like, I would want more of it. Where I think when you have, if you have a connection and you have sex with somebody and it's like a real, and it's rad, it's like, it kind of like fills you, it fills like your cup in a way. Like you leave either the morning after or that night or whatever it is. And you're like, ah, you're like, you just feel kind of like there's this little like high, like this vibration, like, whether it's the chemicals your body releases or whatever, you're just like, you're like, I'm cool. Like you aren't like pining for it right away, which I found for myself, which is why it became a problem because it's like any drug. It's like you, as soon as you get high and then you come down, it's like chasing that again. It's not like anything sustainable and then you need more of it. It's this crazy kind of cycle. And I think that that's, that was for me when I started to realize like these are not, this is not something I'll be able to fit. It's not something that's going to just go away on its own or from fit that I'm like, you're never satiated enough from these things. And I think the same comes from any of those four that you chase, but that's like the, the, the crazy piece of it is that it's the far, like the more that you chase it, the farther it gets away from you. If you focus on those things directly. And I think it's more like, Instead, even with my work, and I'm not quote unquote successful in terms of like financially or or any of those things, I think I'm successful in that I've been able to design a cool life and I'm on my own journey, but not not in like that that typical idea of success. But like this this programming that it's like if one gold medal doesn't do it for you, like maybe it's two, you know? And I realized there's this quote that really resonated with me when I started to dial in like, okay, I think these things like the sex and the, the work are like coming from the same place. This quote that resonated with me and it said, I'd rather be special than happy. And I was like, fuck. That is exactly how I felt for a long time. I'd rather be special than happy. It was like all delayed gratification for the work, which is interesting how those kind of manifested. With the work, it's like com like completely delayed gratification until I can achieve some sort of modicum of success with this compared to with like the pleasure piece, it's all like very immediate and and it becomes kind of like an obsessive compulsion of like how can – this happen now. And I think that one of the difficult pieces about that as well down here, at least, is the way that money, the way that money transacts with sex here. That one of the, I don't want to say one of the nice pieces, but one of the 
the attractive pieces about that for me was that it was transactional. It's like, this is the service. This is what it is. This is the money for it. And it was always like cut and dry compared to dating down here sometimes, I don't know, like a more of a long-term thing. It can sometimes you end up the because of the the power dynamics between North Americans, foreigners, and Colombians, and economics. Like, if you end up paying for everything, it makes you question the authenticity of the affection and the connection. And I guess one of the nice parts about the transactional piece was that it was purely transactional, and that I. We both know exactly what it is going into it compared to that, I think, difficulty. And it doesn't have to be, I think, just in South America. I think this happens a lot of times with foreigners. I think often foreign men, local women, is that dynamic of how much is authentic, how much is is economic and financial. And that's something I think for everybody to figure out on their own of what that what that interplay is that works for you. But... That that for me, I think, has been a piece of it too, being like how we're really trying to figure out like what do I want? And that was even with the whole dating apps thing, being like, are these what is it that I want from this? And I had this a real moment of clarity and was like, I just need to delete all of these and just like find something that's like beneficial and like really ask myself hard questions and dial in like what type of woman do I want? Because if I don't, this is going to lead again towards, I could feel like dark energy creeping up. Like it's hard to describe it, but it's like these like compulsions that start to just like take you over in a weird way. And I started to feel that happen again, especially because then some of these ladies like proposition you. And I was like, dude, I just need to like get all, like I just need to like disconnect from that. I need to spend more time just like reading fucking like, Marcus Aurelius, like meditations or whatever. So I deleted all of them and I was really proud of that. And I felt like a shift in that of like doing the right thing, the right thing for me, like in alignment with the man that I want to be. I almost know it immediately. It was like, it was very clear. I was like being genuinely authentic, the man, building the man I want to be. And the same comes with the music and the success piece where like even going to LA realizing that wasn't like listening to those pieces and coming back out here and then um, kind of reconfiguring my my perception of self, rebuilding my identity around what success is for me, what do I want out of life. It's been very tough and it's been confusing, but it's been, I feel like I'm like on the path and I'm not saying I, I won't, backslide I think that's part of it but there's I've now like six months removed from any of that and that was part of even going to Brazil and like spending the time alone and like why um, I think I have this sort of like strange relationship at times with sex where I'll have like these like extended periods it's almost like fasting like extended periods of just like nothing and then kind of go off the rails. And I think when I look at that and examine that, it almost looks like any sort of addictive behavior of like sobriety in any regard of it's like you don't have a drink for a while and then like, oh, just one. And then you're kind of like back into it. And so for me, that's something that I've been really working on. And I wanted to share with you and I appreciate you being here. And I was just like putting it out there to be like that to help keep me accountable as well um, to my path. And I'm not saying that like I have to completely abstain from sex, period, forever. But that this finding that relationship with it, and I also think with the right person, I think that's a big piece of when, for me with relationships, sometimes I get scared about like, will I ever? Because like, I'm I'm I can get so fucking rigid and into my robot shit that I'm like, will I ever find anybody that like? I can bounce this with. And it's almost like the older that you get, the more you kind of like develop these sort of patterns and habits and routines. It's like harder to slot somebody into. But I really feel like if I find the right person, then I could, then it'll work. 
but being the man I need to be first in order to attract that type of person. And then also around work stuff too. And like this whole chapter recently around like what it is that I want from this, how to kind of detach from from the external validation piece that I think is also tied to the sex shit, like, and like digging deeper into like sense of self and really figuring out like what, like why those exist, where those are from. And then maybe be like, now how can I distance myself from those? Know that they're there and be like, dude, like you're not impervious to this stuff, but to continue to like come back to kind of my North star. And that's where even with the music lately, going to LA, like feel like I was like, off my I'm glad I did it. It was a great experience, great experiment. But to be like out there, I'm like, I'm off my path again. Like I'm not these are things that are not these are behaviors that are not serving me in the way that I I feel like they should be. And so I don't want to keep this podcast. I don't want to make this an hour. This is uh I think this is a great place to wrap it up. I just wanted to share that I'm on the path and I wanted to put that out there to let you know like that this crafted perception of Kia is not always what it seems. Um, But that I really appreciate that you give me the space to share these things with you and that I want this to be a dialogue, even though right now I'm only sharing my piece with you that if there's stuff that you... If any of this resonates with you, um, feel free to share it with me. I think that there's a lot. I feel like I can hold a space now for people that have, that are battling with their dark side more. And that that to me is almost like kind of what the human experience is all about. It's almost like if you don't have that dark side, I'm almost like, even more question. I'm like, Hmm, like what's really going on behind the scenes, but to, to let you know that I'm, that I'm on the path and that this is a work in progress. And one that I'm excited about being able to have feel like feel that energy again, having those, those offers and temptations again, being able to resist them. And that I think we all have that kind of, you can be religious about it or not, but that that kind of like darkness inside of us and it's how do you dance with it in a way and thinking about, just being intentional about what we're doing and why. That for me has been really big around like, if, if I ask why enough times, and dig into either where I'm living, you know, if it's New York, LA, Las Vegas, DC, like th- like those are all the paired with like power, money, pleasure, fame. Like why are we chasing what we're chasing? And instead, how can we like do this, the necessary work to just be more present, happy, purpose-driven now and not need to like arrive somewhere for that to happen and also to be totally aware that I think we're all capable of incredible things and maybe not so incredible things at any time. So thanks for being there for that. Thanks for letting me share that. Um, Yeah. We're doing the work. Doing the work. I appreciate you for real, and I'll be being uh, be back next week with some, hopefully something a little different. But this meant a lot to me. Thanks. Peace.